How did a collection of Black American folktales become the most controversial Walt Disney movie and Disney Park ride? We'll discuss that in this episode of Footnoting History. Hello and welcome to Footnoting History. A reminder that all of our episodes are available on YouTube and fully accessible with transcriptions checked by members of our team. Additionally, to help keep our show ad-free, consider supporting us through our Patreon and our merch shop. Links for YouTube, Patreon, and TeePublic can be found on our website at www.footnotinghistory.com. I'm Elizabeth, and in this episode, I'm exploring the part two to the story of how Joel Chandler Harris's Uncle Remus collections went to the big screen and, decades later, the theme parks. In Jennifer Rittenhouse's work on the Uncle Remus's story in Southern Memory, she makes a claim that we're going to address in this episode. In part one, we focus on the author, Joel Chandler Harris. But as Rittenhouse argues, quote, Harris's Uncle Remus stories need to be understood in terms of readership as well as authorship, end quote. Once a creator releases their creation unto the world, it belongs to not only them, but also their audience. And we see this concept in how Uncle Remus turned into Walt Disney's Song of the South. Now, according to Walt Disney himself, he had been a fan of Uncle Remus since childhood. He read every book of Remus tales he could get his hands on, and then, when he grew up, he read them to his children. He loved the stories. And in 1939, he bought the rights for the stories from Joel Chandler Harris's children. However, the beginning of World War II caused economic hardship for the Disney studios. Artists were laid off. To try and recoup some money, Disney had Snow White re-released, but it wasn't enough. Finally, as the war came to a close, Disney thought he had the answer. Turn the Uncle Remus stories into a live-action movie with only some animation. Now, Disney had never been to the South, but he was most likely familiar with the Gone with the Wind public perception. Wasn't everyone? Even today, the perception that not all plantations were bad or that many enslaved people were happy still pervade the way that this portion of American history is taught, and the first half of the 20th century was no different. As a book and as a movie, Gone with the Wind was incredibly popular. And Walt Disney hoped that Americans' nostalgia for an antebellum version of Southern history invented after the Civil War would continue to bring in revenue. Disney, however, was not actually familiar with the South beyond his reading of Uncle Remus, watching of Gone with the Wind, and what he was taught in school. Once he bought the rights to the works, though, he did make a point of traveling through New Orleans and Atlanta, even visiting the Wren's Nest, Joel Chandler Harris's former home. And he sent one of his best designers, Mary Blair, who many Disney fans will recognize from such rides as Small World. He sent Mary to Georgia for a few weeks to get a feel for the surroundings. According to Thomas Ng, Disney knew that the movie could be controversial if he didn't get that portrayal of Uncle Remus just right. The script went through several rewrites, including one by Maurice Rapp a known Jewish communist who was chosen precisely because he was a Jewish communist and he was supposed to imbue the story with the message that Remus was the protagonist or the hero. Unfortunately, again according to Ng, Rapp's ideas were not followed. However, screenwriters were not the only ones with whom Disney worked with on this. He also contacted Walter White, president of the NAACP, and black intellectual, singer, actor, and left-wing activist Paul Robeson among others. White declined flying out to Los Angeles to provide Disney with insights, and given that Raff's attempts were largely rewritten through several more script revisions, it's hard to say that White's suggestions would have been followed either. Which, I suppose, I should give a short movie synopsis here. Song of the South is supposed to take place during Reconstruction following the end of the Civil War, and Uncle Remus is a former enslaved man now a free man, but continuing to live on the plantation where he'd been enslaved. For those who listened to part one, this should sound somewhat familiar as the setting is largely how Harris closed up his On the Plantation. For those who didn't listen to part one, you may just want to pause right now and do that. 
But back to the movie. Young Johnny. And if you want to go down a sad Google rabbit hole, I suggest you look up the life of Bobby Driscoll, who played Young Johnny. But Young Johnny and his mother have returned to the countryside from Atlanta because Johnny's parents are getting a divorce. Scandalous. It falls to Uncle Remus and Aunt Tempe, played by Hattie McDaniel from Gone with the Wind, to largely care for Johnny. Now, Harris had written approximately 180 Uncle Remus stories, but the movie only includes four. The Wonderful Tar Baby Story, How Mr. Rabbit Was Too Sharp for Mr. Fox, Mr. Rabbit and Br'er Bear, and Br'er Rabbit's Laughing Place. Remus tells young Johnny these stories to help him learn important lessons, deal with bullies, and handle the emotional messiness of his parents' relationship woes. Each of these stories becomes an animated vignette in the movies, a move that impressed 1940s moviegoers. I suppose this is a good place to raise an important point. As most readers of Harris's works know, the conceit is that Remus is telling the stories. We know that Harris based these stories on folk tales he learned in the quarters of enslaved peoples on the Turnwald plantation. What is possible that Harris didn't realize, and almost certain that Disney didn't, is that these folk tales were created and shared by enslaved people as a way to help provide solace and advice to each other. Br'er Rabbit survives on his wits. He can't take on Br'er Bear or Br'er Fox, nor could an enslaved person take on their master or an overseer. But he could try to outsmart them. We know that many enslaved people, for example, pretended to be unintelligent or slow workers to trick their masters. It was a form of resistance that fed into the white supremacist stereotypes that slave owners had, but it also turned the tables on them. And so, by carrying on these stories, Harris was knowingly or not, preserving these tales of resistance. But that isn't what Disney's movie did. Uncle Remus's tales ended up not being of resistance, but rather a promotion of the Lost Cause narrative, as it's difficult to tell from the movie whether slavery is still legal and all of the black people are very happy to work on plantations. According to Daniel Stein, quote, the film neglects many of the cultural specificities of the animal tales including the lessons that self-interest overrides neighborliness, that the amorality of the animals trumps the false morality of the slaveholder, and that life on the plantation is one of terror rather than interracial harmony. While the tales originally presented the violent destruction of animal families as an allegory of the attack that slavery had on black families, Song of the South replicates the surface humor of the tales as a means of bringing a dysfunctional white family back together. Johnny's father returns from Atlanta to rejoin his estranged wife and ailing son at the end of the movie, end quote. And if anyone is interested in diving into a theoretical analysis of Song of the South that includes the use of black laughter, I strongly suggest that you read this article. The citation is noted in our further reading at www.footnotinghistory.com. The movie premiered in Atlanta on Tuesday, November 12, 1946. The premiere was sponsored by the Junior League and the Uncle Remus Memorial Association of Atlanta, Georgia. Interesting footnote to this footnote, Gone with the Wind's premiere, also in Atlanta, Georgia, had likewise been sponsored by the Junior League. For those not in the know, so most of us, the Junior League is a women's only volunteer organization and most of the volunteers come from what would be deemed as high society. Margaret Mitchell, author of Gone with the Wind, was actually blackballed from joining the Junior League for her less-than-desirable public behavior. But apparently, social slights can be overcome with excellent book sales and a movie to boot. To return to Song of the South, the Junior League promised to donate half the premiere portions to Eggleston Children's Hospital in Atlanta, and the Uncle Remus Memorial Society said it would use their portion of the funds to renovate the Wren's Nest, Harris's Atlanta home that had been turned into a museum by Andrew Carnegie. At the time that the movie premiered, Atlanta and Georgia were in the midst of a racial upheaval. In July 1946, a group of white men murdered George and May Dorsey and Roger and Dorothy Malcolm, two black couples. George Dorsey was a World War II veteran who had recently returned home. Dorothy Malcolm was pregnant. The murders had so shocked the nation that President Truman tried, unsuccessfully, to pass anti-lynching legislation. 
Eugene Talmadge, who may have fanned the flames that led to the murders, won the gubernatorial election a week before Song of the South premiered. Even if Walt Disney had tried to make the film portray Remus as a hero, the movie premiered in a city where black people were still supposed to keep their heads down or be murdered for upsetting the white supremacist narrative. A parade for the movie premiere included Walt Disney and the movie's white actors, but none of the black actors, including James Baskett, who played Uncle Remus, or Academy Award winner Hattie McDaniel. Neither of them were allowed to participate due to Atlanta's racial segregation. In fact, they weren't in Atlanta at all for the opening. Now, as a child of the 1980s, I'm familiar with the way the movie was critiqued in the latter half of the 20th century. But what I didn't know was it actually received criticism on its racial depictions right from the moment it was released. For example, as soon as the movie was released in New York, Walter White, president of the NAACP, put out the following announcement that was picked up and carried in many newspapers. Quote, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People recognizes in Song of the South remarkable artistic merit in the music and the combination of live actors and the cartoon technique. It regrets, however, that in an effort to neither offend audiences in the North or South, the production helps to perpetuate a dangerously glorified picture of slavery. Making use of the beautiful Uncle Remus folklore, Song of the South unfortunately gives the impression of an idyllic master-slave relationship which is a distortion of the facts, end quote. Publications like Ebony and the New York Times printed similar criticisms. In addition to these criticisms, the movie just wasn't popular, and it wasn't the box office hit Disney had hoped it would be. Song of the South was considered by many, white and black, to actually be too racist even in 1946. Before Disney+, Plus, the Disney company used to re-release movies every few years or so. Song of the South was re-released in 1956 and 1972, but it did not become a popular film or a moneymaker until that second release in 1972. 1972, by which most of the South had been forced to integrate its schools and white flight had created enormous suburbs, including around Atlanta, became the year Song of the South was a success. The belief, or one theory, is that this movie, which seemingly championed again that lost cause narrative of how life was better when black people were subservient, hit a cultural moment where groups of white Americans saw this movie now as something to protect, not ignore. And then finally, we have the Disney Company's decision to turn Song of the South into Splash Mountain. The re-release of Song of the South in 1986 was celebrated in Atlanta as the premiere 40 years before had been. It would be the last time the movie was released or publicly shown by the Disney Company in the United States. In fact, it's difficult to get a copy of Song of the South. As Jason Spurb noted in his work, a Laserdisc version was available at one point in Japan. And now everyone who is millennial or younger is asking, what's a Laserdisc? But this last re-release was profitable, and the next year the Disney company broke ground and the budget in creating the ride Splash Mountain. To get around many of the problematic aspects of the movie, including how Uncle Remus was meant to be seen by the audience, the Imagineers, the name for the ideal people of the Disney company, simply removed him. Instead, the log flume ride focuses on the animated portion of the movie with Br'er Rabbit, Br'er Fox, and Br'er Bear represented as audio animatronics. And one of the initial stories included in the movie, that of the tar baby who Br'er Rabbit gets stuck into, the bunny now gets trapped by honey. When Walt Disney was originally making Song of the South, he reached out to Alan Locke, a black intellectual and expert on culture whose 1925 work, The New Negro, is considered one of the sparks that brought about the Harlem Renaissance. In this work, Locke wrote, quote, the old Negro has long become more of a myth than a man. The old Negro, we must remember, was a creature of moral debate and historical controversy. His has become a stock figure, perpetuated as historical fiction, partly in innocent sentimentalism, partly in deliberate reactionism. The Negro himself has contributed his share to this through a sort of protective social mimicry forced upon him by the adverse circumstances of dependence. So for generations in the minds of America, the Negro has been more of a formula than a human being, a something to be argued about, condemned, or defended, to be 
kept down or in his place or helped up, to be worried with or worried over, harassed or patronized, a social bogey or a social burden. The day of aunties, uncles, and mammies is equally gone. This popular melodrama has about played itself out, and it's time to scrap the fictions, garret the bogeys, and settle down to realistic facing of facts. End quote. In a similar manner, in response to Disney's letter to him about 25 years later, Locke replied that depending on how Disney handled the making of Song of the South and that of Uncle Remus, this movie could do, quote, wonders in transforming the public opinion about the Negro, end quote. Instead, the movie chose to follow the warm path of portraying plantation life as idyllic, including for the formerly enslaved, now free, yet still seemingly subservient black Americans. Joel Chandler Harris, a proponent of the New South, an industrialized South, might have been surprised by this idealization of antebellum agricultural life. But Splash Mountain went further than keeping Uncle Remus as a stock figure. Instead, it erased him, and all that potential that Locke had seen in Song of the South was removed to make the ride less controversial. I want to return to the quote from Jennifer Rittenhouse that I opened this episode with. Quote, Harris's Uncle Remus stories need to be understood in terms of readership as well as authorship, end quote. The same, as I mentioned, could and has been said of this movie. Disney's Remus was not Harris's Remus, and was certainly not Uncle George Terrell, Old Harbert, or Aunt Chrissy, the enslaved people who had told Harris the Br'er Rabbit tales so many decades earlier. In Song of the South, Subversive African-American folktales became sanitized stories fit for a country that still romanticized a past where not all men and women were treated as if they were born equal. And then Splash Mountain took these folktales and erased their literary and historical origins to make them more palatable to the public. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Footnoting History. As always, please check out our further reading at www.footnotinghistory.com consider subscribing to our YouTube channel, and if possible, please become one of our Patreon supporters. And remember, for now and for always, the best stories are in the footnotes. <laughs>